I think we're talking about this <clears throat> Routh method, Routhian, Ruth. I, I say Routh. Um, actually, we were talking about uh, applying it to the spherical pendulum and the dynamics of the spherical pendulum. We were able to reduce it, even though it should be two degrees of freedom, it could become effectively one degree of freedom because we use the factors conservation of uh, angular momentum about the vertical direction. So I'm going to start there and then and then we'll get into the general Routh method. But this is you know, chaotic versus non-chaotic motion. Spherical pendulum is not chaotic. Even though it might look complicated. And here we mean something specific that it's kind of hard to get into by chaos, but uh, think of it as sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Meaning if I have two initial states and I'm measuring the distance between them, those two initial states will get far apart exponentially fast. So that even after a short time, that small initial distance in phase space between them is growing exponentially. So what does this mean? It means even if you you try to specify the initial condition either with a experiment or in, in a simulation, any small deviation from that is going to grow. So what you'll see is the um, you would see that those two states get far away from each other and are no longer coherent. Um, and you can do a dimensional count. It turns out you need you need three you need freedom to move in three dimensions of phase space. For chaos to happen. And how can you understand this? Well, if you think of a, a two dimensional phase space, and we've sketched a bunch of them. There's always like these you know, closed curves and then other things, but nothing's chaotic. It's, uh, it's all basically periodic motion. Uh, but once you have motion, things that can go into a third direction, then, then things can be chaotic. I mean, that's all just how I have to leave it for now. I'll be teaching a whole course on that next semester on nonlinear dynamics and chaos. It's a 4,000 level course, but um, for mechanical systems, right? So this, the spherical pendulum has two mechanical degrees of freedom, but it's got 4D phase space. So that seems bigger than three. What's going on? Well, it's a 4D phase space, but uh, we've also got, we've got an energy integral Um, I think of it as the Jacobi constant. So we're conserving energy, which reduces the amount of space that you can explore by one. So this reduces it to 3D. And then we have uh, momentum integral, which then says, well, on this 3D thing, you can only explore 2D. I mean, what each of these is doing, each integral is implying that there's a 3D surface and 2D is the intersection of those 3D surfaces. Um, it's a bit hard to do it when we think of four dimensions. Think of three dimensions. Think of a 3D world. If we had a 3D phase space and we have with uh, two integrals, each integral, just by its nature, is going to uh, give us 2D surface. 
and I've got a little sketch, assuming the internet works, of what that is. No results. Okay, how about, how about now? One of these is cool. There we go. Here's sort of a general, we've got two surfaces, and in this case, these are two planes, and they intersect. We got the the green plane and the blue plane, and they intersect in the red plane. I mean, red line. So we got 2D surfaces intersect in a line. And these two 2D surfaces, they generically intersect in a 1D curve. And we could have more exotic situations. So suppose one of these surfaces was a cylinder shape and the other one is spherical shape, then you would have a situation like this over here. You still have generally, we've got these two 2D surfaces and they're, they're intersecting in a curve. It's this weird kind of edge of a potato chip type curve, but it's a curve. So the, the rule is if you have an n-dimensional phase space, integrals imply you've got two n minus one dimensional surfaces. The intersection of two two n minus one dimensional surfaces is a two n minus two. So it, it, it works in 3D, it works in n d or two n. Um, so maybe we should say that again so you can to see it. If we have an n-dimensional phase space, each integral implies uh, motion is restricted to a n minus one dimensional surface. And if you have two, the uh, the intersection of two n minus one dimensional surfaces is a n minus two dimensional surface. We actually, there's another term for this. This would be called a surface of co-dimension one. So you start labeling things by how many dimensions less they are than the ambient space. So two co-dimension one surfaces intersect in a co-dimension two surface. And in the case of the uh, spherical pendulum, we've got, uh, it's 4D phase space, but we've got two co-dimension one integrals, one from energy, one from momentum, so actually the motion is really just in 2D. It's probably on some kind of 2D shape. Um, and you know this, these shapes could be interesting shapes. It's probably a torus. So if you start with some initial condition, it's just sort of moving around on a torus, which means it'll look periodic, but with two frequencies, so, but not chaotic because you're restricted to this torus. So on the other hand, so that's the spherical pendulum with its two degrees of freedom. The double pendulum, which I don't have, there's two pens attached. The double pendulum is also two degrees of freedom. And you even, most of you simulated the double pendulum for the last homework. The double pendulum is chaotic It's still two degrees of freedom, but it doesn't, and it does conserve energy, conserves energy. So it has an energy integral. That means for any initial condition, it's exploring a three-dimensional subset of the full four-dimensional phase space, but that's enough to be chaotic because it doesn't, it doesn't conserve momentum. So it doesn't have that second in integral.
Um, so let me show you a, a video, a couple of videos that illustrate that. If I can get them to work. So this shows, um, this is, it looks like one double pendulum, but it's actually 20 double pendula with slightly different initial conditions. And so we're just following and tracing what the second mass does. So you can now at some point see, okay, oh, I see that there's 20 there. They started out together and then, whoa, one, something happened and now they're just all totally incoherent. They're all doing their own thing. So this is displaying sensitivity of initial conditions. They started out very close together. You couldn't even see that they were just slightly off in their angle. And then after a pretty short time, they uh, it's like they're all over the place in this three-dimensional subset of their four-dimensional phase space. And it's not just something you see in uh, simulation. This is a, a video by uh, Stephen Strogatz and Howard Stone. This is Steve Strogatz again. Uh, they got a double pendulum. They have two double pendula. And they're just sort of convincing you, look, it's a double pendulum. And then he will, he'll sh he's got two right next to each other. And then at some point he releases them and, and you'll be able to see, see what happens. The and they, since it's chaotic, they are doing different things. So it's real. So this sort of dimension counting game, um, I, I don't know what the uh, what that three-dimensional energy surface looks like for the pendulum. I mean, the double pendulum, but I'll just draw it as a block. It's not, not really a block, but it can explore this full three-dimensional space. And uh, that's enough room to be chaotic. Any questions about chaos? Does this imply any time we have a three-dimensional plus phase space that we have chaotic motion? Uh, like generically, yes. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it, if you have a, if you have a 3D, a three-dimensional ODE, then generally you're going to have chaos. Or you, in this case, we're having sort of like higher dimensional ODEs that are restricted to a surface. So it's like they're effectively a lower dimensional ODE. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to say yes. Yeah. Unless there's something really special going on, but usually the special stuff you'll understand in terms of integrals like there could be integrals that you don't know about and you you would i guess discover that by trying solutions but then that means that if there are integrals they can exist without you knowing about them and um but i think a general if you were to just sort of randomly pick an ode uh it's going to give chaos in three dimensions or more All right, uh, what are we doing here? We're gonna talk about the, the Routh, the general Routhian procedure. Okay. So enough with chaos. That's more for your just general edification. I'm not going to be quizzing you on chaos. OK, so this is in, it's in Greenwood. And I think these pages, which I think is in chapter two. Yep. All right. So 
we went through an example last time where uh, I was trying to gently introduce this procedure. It's all, it's based on when you write the Lagrangian, does a certain coordinate or group of coordinates show up explicitly in the Lagrangian? So they're called ignorable. And there's another term that's older. I don't like it so much, but you sometimes see this in the literature, cyclic, ignorable or cyclic, and they'll either call them variables or coordinates. I don't know why they call it cyclic because they don't have to be even an angle. Um, but if you have a ignorable, I'll use the term ignorable. If you have an ignorable coordinate, those are the ones uh, such that if you take the partial derivative of L with respect to it, it equals zero, which means the Lagrangian does not explicitly depend on those coordinates. It depends on their velocities, but not the coordinate itself. So here's what you'll we'll do for uh, ease of writing the equations. We're gonna group our coordinates so that the first K of them are the ignorable ones, lowercase k. Actually, the first k are the non-ignorable ones, sorry. Which means the Lagrangian does depend on those. So what are we doing here? We've got, uh, we've got q1 through n, but we'll group these so that Q1 through K are the non-ignorable. And then these remaining ones, Q, K plus one, all the way to Q, N. We've got K non-ignorable and N minus K ignorable. Okay, and the Lagrangian, will depend on just the non-ignorable explicitly. But of course it depends on all of the velocities. If it didn't depend on the velocity, then it's not one of your degrees of freedom. So you wouldn't keep it around. Okay. Then the Lagrange's equations are the following. Um, because the first k are non-ignorable, right? What do we have? We'll divide this into uh, i goes from one through k. So this would be partial l partial q i dot minus partial l partial q i. And in the non-ignorable directions, it's okay to have a non-conservative force. So these are the non-ignorable dynamics. It's almost like they demand your attention. No, it's just this specific you know, meaning we have here. In the ignorable, we've got D, DT, partial L, partial Q, I, dot equals zero. So those that's that's the ignorable dynamics. So we've got those as the Lagrange's equations. The procedure involves defining a new function kind of based on the Lagrangian, but then subtracting some things off of it, the Routhian function. And that is, we use capital R. It's a, it's a function of these one, Q1 through QK, non-ignorable coordinates. And the Q1 dot 
So QK dot uh, the generalized velocities of those non-ignorable coordinates. And then these betas, which are, um, which are what? Beta I equals partial L partial Q I dot evaluated at the initial time. So they're based on initial conditions. So that's the dependence of the, the Routhian. What does it look like? It looks like the Lagrangian and then you subtract off a summation. I goes from K plus one to N beta I Q I dot. So we're subtracting off things that are related only to the ignorable coordinates. <clears throat> so these betas, we've got these set of uh, N minus K betas that depend on initial conditions. Uh, this index here for the betas just from k plus one to n. We got n minus k of those. And I guess this is an important note. These n minus k equations um, can be used to rewrite the ignorable generalized velocities of quotes around there. That means um, Q K plus one dot through Q N dot. You'll, you'll be able to write those ignorable generalized velocities as functions of the betas. And the remaining, the non-ignorable generalized velocities. Which is what we did, you know, last time. So that means all of these QIs, QI dots up here are being rewritten in terms of non-ignorable things and these betas. So that means that R, the function R, it's an explicit function of the K non-ignorable coordinates and their velocities. and these betas. So we've effectively reduced our degrees of freedom from N to K. And so it's we're gonna treat R like it's a Lagrangian where we've effectively reduced our degrees of freedom from N to K. So the more ignorable coordinates you have, the greater the kind of reduction in the phase space and the so there let's keep our routhian up there the routhian equations of motion and there's so there's there's only k of them and it looks exactly like the lagrangian but now with r And we will also we'll keep the non-conservative force on the right-hand side. So here, I goes from one to uh, K. If you wanted to reconstruct what the dynamics were in the ignorable coordinates, it's related to this step here, where you rewrote the ignorable generalized velocities in terms of the betas and the 
non-ignorable things. So these are, what are these? These are second order ODEs. Okay, second order ODEs for uh, those non-ignorable coordinates. Okay, great. Uh, there's something else we can say. If you have, if, uh, if there are no non-conservative forces, then there's a, and I haven't actually seen this in a book, but it's true. There's a Jacobi integral like conserved quantity uh, I guess we could call it H sub R and so this is going to be you take the you take the sum I goes from 1 to K of partial R partial Q I dot times Q I dot minus R and it's a constant of motion. And I, I would assume it's uh, you know, proportional to conser conservation of energy. Um, so what you, well, you actually need two things. You need that there are no non-conservative forces and uh, partial R partial T equals zero. So that your R doesn't explicitly depend on time, which I think even up here, I wrote a Lagrangian that didn't have time in it because I'm just not paying attention to that case. But, so this is a constant of motion. If you were to take the total derivative of HR along trajectories, you would get that it's zero. I don't know what to call it. The Routh Jacobi integral. Um, okay, so let, let's look at, look at some of examples um, and maybe you're wondering when you know, what, uh, what does this does this mean anything is there is there more going on well there's a connection between this method in fact ignorable coordinates and um, constants of motion but also physical symmetries So you could kind of deduce uh, where there should be constants of motion. This is a, I'll give a, a crude statement of something called Noether's theorem. And this is that for every symmetry, there is a corresponding constant of motion. And this is called, uh, there's any uh, there's, it's Noether's theorem uh, by Emmy Noether. So if you have a Lagrangian and it should depend on three degrees of freedom, X1, X2, X3. And so X1 dot, X2 dot, X3 dot, suppose it, doesn't depend on x2 explicitly. So there's some kind of blank there. Oh, okay. That means there's some symmetry with respect to that x2 direction. Let me give an example. Um, if we have a point mass in a gravity field, So uh, throwing a brick, 
so point mass in a gravity field. Uh, I play with my dog outside. He really loves to go chase after point masses that are flying through our gravity field. Um, so there's X, Y, and then Z is vertical. And here's a point mass. So Z is the, the vertical coordinate. If I were to write the Lagrangian for this, it'd be one half, right? This thing could have a, you know any speed. So it'll have an X dot Y dot Z dot dependence, one half M X dot squared plus Y dot squared plus Z dot squared. And then um, to minus the potential energy, potential energy, We'll say that uh, the xy plane is the ground. So m, g, c. Well, if you look at the dependence of this, it does not depend explicitly on x and y. It only depends on z. That means I could move this mass anywhere in x, y. So there's a symmetry in x and y. X and y are absent. They don't, there's no dependence on them. So there's symmetry in X and Y, meaning it doesn't matter what X and Y coordinate you release the particle at or toss it. You're still going to get the same dynamics. Um, and so there's corresponding constants of motion. Those are going to be the linear momentum in the X and Y directions. So basically we say, we could say there's symmetry with respect to the horizontal direction. So horizontal linear momentum is conserved. Uh, I'll give another example. We've looked at the cart mass system quite a bit. I mean, sorry, cart pendulum. This is a, a, a favorite of controls courses, right? Where we got our cart moving horizontally and there's a pendulum. So if we looked at the number of degrees of freedom, we would say, well, there's, there's X and there's Y. So this is a two degree of freedom system sorry, X and theta. And if you write the Lagrangian, it's a function of X, theta, X dot, theta dot, or it should be, if you would look at the actual Lagrangian, it doesn't depend on X. So we put a little underscore there uh, to remember our fallen coordinate. So X, um, we, we would say, you know, mathematically there, X is an ignorable coordinate, but then, you know, physically what's going on, there's symmetry in the X direction. The dynamics of this thing doesn't depend on where you are in X. It does depend pretty significantly on what theta is because that's gonna make the mass move a certain amount, but where you are in X, it doesn't matter. So this has symmetry in the X direction or horizontal direction. And that's why X doesn't explicitly show up, only the X velocity. So there's a corresponding constant of motion. And you could probably guess what it is. It's going to be the linear momentum in X. And how would we get that linear momentum? Um, well, it turns out, I've kind of hinted at this, the idea of generalized momenta. So P sub X is defined as partial L partial X dot. So P of any coordinate is partial L partial QI dot for that coordinate. But in this case, piece of X, this is a, because um, L doesn't depend on X, the Lagrange equation is D by DT partial L partial X dot, and then it would be minus zero equals zero. So, that's d by dt px equals zero. So the linear momentum in x is conserved. 
and it comes from symmetry. What another example? Suppose I have a baton falling off of a wall. I hate it when batons fall off walls. Actually, I don't. It's, I think it's pretty exciting. Um, where is it? Baton, there you are, baton. All right, this is the continuation of the uh, epic saga of the two mass system sliding off a wall. So once it does slide off a wall, this thing goes, once it's connected, while it's connected to the wall, it's just one degree of freedom. When it comes off the wall, you actually have a jump in the degrees of freedom. It goes from one degree of freedom to two degrees of freedom. And that's significant in its own right. right? It has a baton releases from the wall. A constraint has gone away. The system jumps from uh, one degree of freedom to two. And that, that means like all of a sudden, phase space went from two dimensions to four dimensions. It's, um, it's kind of a weird situation. It's, it falls under, um, if you were to actually want to research this, it's called non-smooth mechanics because something significant happened when this thing released from the wall. Um, but once we're in this case, so, at the moment that it's released from the wall, we've got a two degree of freedom system and we would use X and theta as our degrees of freedom. If we look at the Lagrangian for this, we should get X theta, X dot, theta dot dependence. But now just physically think about this. Will the motion depend on what X is? It actually doesn't. You could be 100 miles from the wall or two millimeters. The dynamics of the baton's gonna be the same. So there is a symmetry in the X direction. So that we will, you should not find dependence on X. So mathematically, you just, you know, oh, partial L, partial X is zero. Okay, so there is a symmetry in the X direction, this horizontal direction, which, which makes sense. And it, there's conservation of linear momentum in the X direction. But you don't actually have to know that to do the next steps, which is effectively reduce this from two degrees of freedom actually back down to one degree of freedom. You would construct the, uh, the Routhian function. And I guess there'd be this beta X in there. So this would be L minus beta x, x dot, where, you know, what's beta x? Beta x is partial L, partial x dot, evaluated at initial conditions. And then you use that to rewrite x dot in terms of other things, so that you have something that's just a function of the non-ignorable coordinate theta, its time derivative, and beta x. And then you get your single, Routh equation. And we're not, for this case, we are not including any friction. So zero. And what you'll find from this is that, um, what you find is that theta double, you get theta double dot, we usually like to write this as theta double dot equals something. What you'll get is this is a function of theta and theta dot. So that means we can't can't write it the right hand side. We can't write this as the negative uh, derivative of an effective potential. 
because of this pesky theta dot term. And it's it's not a theta dot, dot term that's due to damping or anything. It's just there. Um, because you are asked to write this in some first order form. And you could do it if it was in this form, you'd say, oh, well, one half theta dot squared plus this effective potential is equal to some constant, the effective energy. But you can't do that for this case. So you could think about what you could do. Um, I mentioned that Jacobi-like integral. So that Jacobi-like integral would show up here. And that's going to be a constant. So that means you could, you'll be able to write with initial conditions, you could write this as a first order equation, which means if you've got d theta dt is some function of just theta, um, then you're able to rewrite this as d theta over g theta equals dt. And you can actually in integrate both sides to figure out when theta goes to, I guess it's pi over two. Because when theta goes to pi over two, that means the particle two has hit the ground. So go for it. Um, yeah, okay. We look at another case. Yeah, let's look at more. We've we keep looking at things where there's only a symmetry in like one direction. What if you have symmetry in two directions? So another example: spinning top. I have in my hand this ornately decorated spinning top. It's uh from Mexico, it's called a, tr a trompo, and you have to like tie a string and get it going. And I'm not very good at it, but it's cool. So this is the situation of, you know, if I get this spinning, how's it gonna move? In an idealized world where there's like no air resistance and stuff. So the spinning top, if you were to, Write the equations for spinning top. Um, some things here are hard to see, but all the key things are there. Like you see the center, there's a center of mass to this. I don't know, it's, it's somewhere along the axis of symmetry. It's got symmetry. So if you treat this, um, like a rigid body, then it, it'll have um, a moment of inertia about this direction, you know, that this, the symmetry axis, and then it'll have equal moments of inertia about the other two directions. So that's the spinning top. And the spinning top, you can either use uh, Euler's second law or Lagrange's equations. So if you were to you were to work on this problem. You could use either, or I mean, maybe you want to use both and see if they get the same answer. Or there's second law or Lagrange's equations. You've uh, already done a lot of the hard work for the Lagrange's equations part, so you might try that. We've got the point, this point O, the pivot point. We, it's, we're assuming that's fixed, which if you've ever spun a top, right, it typically is fixed. You know, it's may, sometimes just little circles, but forget that. It's, uh, you think of that as an inertially fixed point, so that, that helps you out. 
because then you could do everything with respect to that inertially fixed point. Um, I guess you call it a pivot point because it's kind of pivoting around there. Um, we've got right, I3 is the moment about the B3 direction. So you see how we wrote B3 is the symmetry axis here. So the the B frame is an inertia um, principal axis frame. Three direction, and then the other two I one and I two are equal. Are right, the moments of inertia about um, B one and B two? Um, the only, because we're assuming that O is an inertially fixed pivot point, we can assume that the only active force is gravity. The only active or applied force is gravity. And the nice thing about gravity is, right, we could write it as coming from a potential energy. So U is mgl cosine theta it's just mg times the height of the center of mass and given um rewriting theta is the deflection from the vertical then that's what we get what about the kinetic energy well and you're told uh, use the three two three euler angles but you actually already did that in a earlier homework. So so you did this in an earlier homework. That's part of why you're asked to do it. In fact, it was just it was given in the problem statement. You should get a kinetic energy that looks like this. So you've already got that. Um, you might be wondering, well, how can I use that? That was about uh, what you did previously was for like a box or a cylinder or something in space. There was no fixed point, but that's okay. Because if you were to write the kinetic energy with respect to the point O, then the procedure would be you do one half M velocity of that point O, but that's, you know, that's zero. The point O is inertially fixed. And then one half, um, angular velocity of the B frame with respect to the inertial frame, transpose, the moment of inertia matrix about the point O in the B frame, everything in the B frame. But like I said, you already, you've already written this. So just look it up. And what you'll find is that the Lagrangian, which is that kinetic minus potential energy it should be a function of our three degrees of freedom and their rates of change. So it should be a function of all of these Euler angles and their rates of change. But what you'll find is it is not. Um, it and and this is yeah this is why we picked. Three, two, three Euler angles. Some other set of Euler angles might not have shown you this, but in this case, you'll find that these two, um, psi and phi, are ignorable. So you've got two ignorable coordinates. That just means they're not present in the Lagrangian. And so you could write the um, Routhian should be Lagrangian minus, you could write it this way, beta psi, psi dot minus beta phi, phi dot, where you, uh, you write psi dot and phi dot in terms of the betas. and the non-ignorable coordinates or velocities. OK. 
Okay, and this this will just be pretty amazing, but this thing acts just like it's effectively a one degree of freedom system. With that one degree of freedom being the angle that the top makes with the vertical. And then the other motions you could reconstruct from this rewriting of psi dot and phi dot. But really all of the major action is happening in this single degree of freedom. And right, this, this makes sense from that symmetry argument. Should this depend on, should the motion depend on where you are and you know, rotating in the either psi or phi and it should not. So you can hopefully convince yourself of that. And then, uh, then you'll start seeing symmetries everywhere. This stuff about symmetry does deserve though a cautionary tale. Uh, I can't give any secret weapons without there being a tale of warning. So let me give a cautionary tale. An ancient tale of warning. Cautionary, yeah, I don't know, cautionary tale. What do I mean? Uh, sometimes, I'll put it in red. Sometimes. The choice of coordinates conceals the existence of ignorable coordinates. And that's not good. And I guess, you know, but that also means it's kind of just by your choice of coordinates, you conceal the existence of symmetries. Um, so here's one. Thanks to uh, Descartes, we're all enamored of Cartesian coordinates. So what about orbital motion in 2D? If I were to analyze orbital motion in 2D, so let's say I have a a massive body here. And then I've got, I'll write them as X and Y directions. Here's a small mass. Think of this as a satellite moving around the earth. So satellite moving around the earth. Um, I would have to write uh, one over R term for my Lagrangian. So if I used of Lagrangian and wrote this in terms of Cartesian coordinates, right, x and y, then this would be one half m x dot squared plus y dot squared for the kinetic energy. And then this would be minus, um, right, we know this is going to be, the potential energy will be minus some constant, I'm just writing k for that constant over distance r and r is square root x squared plus y squared. So we have a one over r potential. K is related to the gravitational constant and the mass of the big thing, but who cares? It's just a constant. So plus k square root x squared plus y squared. Well, this thing has full dependence. <laughs> Notice this depends fully on x, y, x dot and y dot. So we might just say, oh, well, this doesn't have any symmetry because there's no, neither X or Y or an ignorable coordinate. Well, okay, yeah, there's no symmetry in X or Y. But uh, if you've done anything with orbital motion, you know, uh, there should be something else going on here. There should be like conservation of angular momentum. What did I do wrong? Uh, well, if you used Cartesian, I mean, if you use polar coordinates, then, then you would see because then your Lagrangian would be one half M. Uh, we've used polar coordinates so much, hopefully this just comes to second nature, what writing the velocity squared is r dot squared plus r squared theta dot squared. And then the one over r potential, just r. So then you're like, oh, okay, I see. 
I'll even put that ah, I see. Uh, theta is an ignorable coordinate. Yep. So that means there, there's a symmetry in uh, theta, right? Which makes sense. If you were to take this whole thing and rotate it, the dynamics will be the same. If I change R, well, the dynamics aren't the same because of this dependence. So there's a symmetry in theta, which corresponds to uh, generalized momentum conservation in theta, which in our usual terms, we would say there's angular momentum conservation. And that's because we looked at this and we go, okay, this depends on R. Well, I don't see any dependence on theta, R dot theta dot. So a cautionary tale. Um, you know, you might ask, oh, how do I, how do I get around this? I don't know, Pick good coordinates. I, there's no, well, I can't tell you now, that's more secrets. Uh, it is possible to find variables that make all the coordinates ignorable, but uh, don't tell anyone. There, so there's a, there's a procedure and we're not going to go over it. Uh, that allows you to make all coordinates into ignorable coordinates. But it goes beyond the scope of this class. Uh, it, it even goes beyond the kind of Lagrangian mechanics into the realm of Hamiltonian mechanics. And this idea of turning all variables into ignorable coordinates um, is related to what's called the action angle variables. But um, if you want, in uh, kind of a follow-on course to this called the Advanced Dynamics, uh, but some of the lectures are online, second half from last semester. Maybe I'll teach in 2022. I don't know, uh, but that's that's that. Um, that's kind of curious. Okay. Other questions? This is a lot of stuff about symmetries and Routhian procedure, but has anyone tried the homework and been able to successfully do anything? It's due in a week. Okay. Uh, can I? can I say? Uh, 